So you now understand what the DFT does and the, what the FFT is and what that tells us, right? It's really just telling us for a signal what's um, happening inside that signal. But we actually also need some extra tools um, in order to get our speech features into, into the computer. Um, so let's think about this a little bit. Let's say I say the word um, dress, right? And let's say the waveform looks, I don't know, something like, uh, like this. It won't, right? But let's say it looks something like this. And this is the word dress. Now, what will happen is um, the frequency content, if you look at the first few samples of this word, will be very, very different from the last samples. And if we just took the discrete Fourier transform of this whole thing, then we will actually run into issues because it's just going to have frequency content all over the place. And we actually want to capture the finer grained um, things inside the signal. Okay, so the strategy we're going to follow is, is actually pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to take the first, um, let's say 25 milliseconds of this word, and we're going to take uh, a window over that 25 milliseconds. And um, just as a reminder, right, I drew this out as a continuous signal, but it's really a sampled signal. It's got little dots, right, little captured snapshots of the signal, but I just draw it as a continuous signal. And we take that sampled signal, and what we do is we calculate the DFT just for that little um, snapshot, okay? So let's just put it in a, in a little box here, and we say that the DFT, of course, I, I, don't, I have no idea what that would look like, but let's just draw it out and say it looks something like, like this, okay? That's just for this uh, first window here, for that window. We get that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move this window a little bit. Let's quickly jump ahead right to the end. So for the end part, again, we're going to take 25 milliseconds here. Okay. Um, again, this is the sampled signal. And then what we're going to do is for this 25 milliseconds, we're going to calculate the discrete time Fourier transform for that little snippet. And again, I don't know exactly what that would look like but let's say the frequency content has changed a little bit. Okay, so we take the DFT of this window. Now what we do in the middle is that we're going to move this window, we're basically going to slide it across. So what we're going to do is, instead of taking that window, we're going to move that, say 10 milliseconds in. So we take a window here, and we take the DFT of, of that window here. And again, I don't know, what it looks like, maybe it's changed a little bit like that. And then you take the DFT of the next window. Okay, now the idea is that you sweep this window across from beginning to the end, and you take these little snapshots of, of DFTs. If you have all these little you know photos of the DFTs as you go across the, the, the signal, now you know what's happening in this word dress at different time points. So the idea is that the first window would capture the um, frequency content of the D in dress. And then this last window here right at the end, that should tell you um, the frequency content of an S. And I can already tell you that with speech, what we normally do is we've got a window that's 25 milliseconds long. And um, we basically have a step size of 10 milliseconds. So we get a little window every um, 10 milliseconds. And the advantage of that is that that means that we get a little window every 10 milliseconds, but we can use a little bit more data to estimate the frequency content in that window. So we're using 25 milliseconds here, which is longer because that gives us um, a little bit more data to basically calculate the DFT with. Um, and those numbers, people have fiddled with those numbers for many years, and that's that's basically what they what they came up with. So I should maybe say that this thing here, this is called the short time Fourier transform or the STFT. Let me just write that there, STFT, short time Fourier transform. It's really a discrete Fourier transform because we're doing it computationally, but that's called the short time Fourier transform. And to visualize the short time Fourier transform, we often use something called the spectrogram. 
Now, what the spectrogram looks like, um, I'm going to draw it out and I hope to do it in a pretty way, but let's see what happens. So what we're going to do is on this axis here, we're going to have amplitude, okay? This is like the spectral amplitude, okay? And then on this axis here, you have to use your 3D head now. Here we're going to have frequency, okay? Um, okay, cool. It's similar to what we have here. Here we also have amplitude, and here we've got on this axis, we've got frequency. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this first snapshot from my short time Fourier transform, this first one, and I'm just going to plot it here. Okay, I'm going to plot this thing. So maybe it goes something like this. Okay, uh, this is supposed to be, that picture there is supposed to be exactly that picture, but in three dimensions. Okay, cool. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move 10 milliseconds along. Okay, so I'm actually going to introduce an extra axis here, going that way, which is the time axis. And what I'm going to do is 10 milliseconds later, I'm going to take my blue pen and I'm going to draw this picture at 10 milliseconds. So maybe it goes here. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is 10 milliseconds later, I take the next picture and I plot that there. Okay. Move my window again, 10 milliseconds later, I plot again and again and up to the, uh, you know, last window. So you get these, this, this is really a three dimensional plot. And the cool thing about this plot is that if you have this plot, um, so you can put in a single signal, use um, Python's matplotlib library, for example, to plot this three dimensional thing. And then you can rotate it in the space and see what what's happening. And this plot basically summarizes exactly how the frequency content of the signal changes over time. Because if I've got, you know, high energy at this point, you know, high amplitude at this point at the beginning of my signal, then I know that, you know, there's this um, 200 hertz component here. While then later on, I see, oh, I've got a really high uh, amplitude here, which is maybe, I don't know, at 1000 hertz. Um, so now I know that, you know, in the beginning I had this um, 100 hertz thing, but over time it, it changed into this um, 1000 hertz thing. And that allows me on one plot to just see all of that, um, which is pretty awesome, right? So if I have the word trace, um, I'll show you some of these plots in a second, S is a very high frequency component. So you would expect here to, to have um, a lot of energy higher um, at higher frequencies, where other signals, um, valves and things might have lower frequency um, stuff happening. Super neat, spectrogram, really useful. Normally though, we don't actually look at the spectrogram as a 3D plot, probably because it's hard to put it in, in textbooks and you know, you need to rotate it and look at it in, in different ways. So instead of using this three dimensional plot, normally what we do is we, we plot it um, in a two dimensional way. And the way we do it, I think of it um, as you're basically looking at this plot from the, from the top, okay? So we're just going to have um, two axes. The one axis is going to be um, frequency, okay? And then the other axis is going to be time, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to color this thing. It's basically going to be a, a little image. And what we're going to do is high values here is going to be colored um, in a light way and low values here are going to be colored in a dark way. Um, so I should really just show you what it looks like, but just um, so that the notes are slightly complete, let's just pretend that my blue pen is, um, is very, a very, very light color. Then you might have, you know, if, if in the first um, 25 milliseconds you've got a very low frequency, then you'll, you might have a little um, kind of light spot there. And then later on you might have a very um, high frequency component, so you've got you know, a, a, a light spot there. And what you s will see is, and we'll look at this in a second, this is disgusting, but I hope you get the point. So you basically have these kind of light spots. And the idea is that if I've got light spots here, then I know at this time point 
we've got um, high frequency components. If um, it's light here, then at this time point, we've got um, high frequency components. Okay, this plot doesn't really doesn't make sense uh, at the moment. So let's just look at this um, uh, in in the notebook. So um, I'll, I'll show you a few different signals, but let's just start with this um, siren, which is kind of horrific. Um, so just, um, you know, put on headphones now, don't do this in the office, but let's just listen to this. Okay. Okay. Now that signal is, um, I should say that that signals that looks like this, where the frequency isn't, um, you know, the frequency content doesn't stay constant over time, it's the technical term for that is a non-stationary signal. And speech, of course, is a definitely a non-stationary signal. So is this signal, right? Uh, it's got this varying frequency kind of to the extreme. Okay. What we have here at the bottom is we've got the spectrogram of the signal. So we took the short time Fourier transform. Here you can see I, I'm taking the short time Fourier transform. Um, I tell it how many samples to have in one window. In other words, I tell it how long this window should be. Okay. And I also tell it the hop length, which is basically how, um, how many samples I should leave between different windows, basically that length there, uh, you know, from there to there to the next window. Okay. So I give it those, um, those numbers in samples. Okay. And then I calculate the short time Fourier transform also taking the absolute value. Um, because really this is a bunch of DFTs. So we're converting, we're just looking at the amplitudes of those complex numbers. And this is the plot I get. So over time, the signal is around, um, two seconds long. Um, and what you can see here is that, um, it starts out at 4,000 Hertz, then it goes up to just below 7,000, then it comes down to, um, you know, just below, um, just above a thousand and so on. And it varies over time. And the cool thing is you can see that on this, on this plot and that's, it goes like, wee, 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 right? So it starts at, uh, wee. okay. That was super inaccurate, but you get the point. Okay. And. This is awesome, right? Let's just quickly, just for, for sanity, quickly just look at what it would look like if we just calculated the FFT, right? We didn't actually, um, we didn't actually calculate the short time Fourier transform, but just took the FFT of this, of this signal. mp.fft.fft of X. That's my like little siren noise. Um, this will be a bunch of complex numbers. I'm going to take the absolute value of that. Okay, that gives me um, stuff all over the place. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do np dot, uh, sorry, plot dot plot. Okay, um, I'm not labeling the axis here. Um, and I don't want you to worry about the second half. Um, but here what you're seeing is basically you're just getting this very, very weird something that looks like it comes from the Lord of the Rings. Um, thing out of your FFT. It's almost impossible to see what the frequency, no, I mean, it is impossible to see what the frequency content in that signal is like, what's happening in that signal. But if you look at the short time Fourier transform, um, then these light regions, right? The, these light regions, that's where we have peaks in this 3D plot. And then these dark regions, that's where we have valleys. So what happened was you took the DFT of the first few 10 millis uh, 25 milliseconds of the siren noise and that's the FFT values there and then you moved it 10 milliseconds again took a window of 25 milliseconds calculated FFT again and so on and you're moving across and you can see exactly how the frequency content changes over time. Um, so let's just plot um, the spectrogram for um, some other sounds. Um, here let me play this. Dress, start. Dress, start. Okay. And here is the spectrogram for that sentence, dress, start. And what you can see, um, again, like I said, dark means low energy, um, light means um, higher amplitudes at, the, at those components. Okay, now let's quickly look at this. There are actually people that can read this stuff. I'm not one of them. Uh, 
but we can we can still observe some things. Like, let's quickly play it again. Dress, start. Okay, so what you will see is that the 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 clip starts with the dress start. Um, let me start with stuff that's all, always easiest for me is the sounds. So S has normally quite high frequency components, and you can see that here. Um, most speech content is below um, eight thousand hertz or eight eight kilohertz, and S will have very high frequency components. So this is the it starts with dress. That's the S from the end of dress, and can you guess what that is? That's the S from start. Okay, so you've got these two S sounds. Um, okay, cool. What else is easy to see? Normally the T and D sounds are easy to see because, um, so let's look at start. You normally with T, there's this kind of break in the in the stream where nothing happens. It's almost a silence. Um, so because you're basically closing things off in your in your mouth, right? And this is the little silence before, t and then you've got this little burst of energy kind of all over the place there. And uh, then you can maybe guess what this is. That's the second teen start. Um, I think this is, the, here you've got the duh at the beginning, right? It's also silence and then boom, something happens. And then here we've got the two vowels, the vowel in, uh, in dress and the vowel in start. Okay. And like I said, people can, can read the stuff. Um, um, I'm not, not one of them but it's pretty cool. Okay, so it's kind of crazy, right? You look at this plot and you can already start to see what's going on. And if we want to have speech features for our um, speech processing models, then of course, this is the type of features that you would like. This isn't the end though, because um, we're going to do a little bit more processing before just feeding this into our model.